Hello, I'm Melanie and this is another chapter from Applegate by Fiona Citron. So in the last chapter we left Madge and Caroline Crover lost on the moor but they just sighted a farm. So let's see what happens when they approach it. In chapter 11, Five Ways Farm. Sure enough they soon found themselves in the middle of a wide cobbled farmyard. Madge looked cautiously along but the place seemed deserted except for Jester and the Grey Shire. We're now standing outside a large barn. Let's make the horses comfortable, she said, and then find the farmer. Everyone's probably huddled around the fire on a night like this. Caroline agreed, and they opened the rickety door at which the grey is nuzzling. Inside was a long row of stalls, each one filled with deep golden straw, and provided with full water buckets and hay nets. Of other horses, however, there wasn't any sign. Madge thought it might be a pony trekking stables and everything had been made ready for the pony's return. She hoped the owners wouldn't mind leaving the horses there for a while. And with, a with this touching faith in human nature, she led the two animals in, rubbed them down and left them both to rest in luxury. She was just about to open the door again when a cry from Caroline attracted her attention. Madge! yelled the builder's daughter. There's a whole room here full of old-fashioned harness! Madge walked down the row of stalls and ducked through the narrow opening at the far end. Caroline had been right, for she found herself in a large whitewashed room with walls that were completely covered in sets of cart horse tack. There were heavy black collars with long supple traces coiled below them, huge cumbersome bridles with brass-mounted brass winkers, and such a variety of other ge gear that the girl was at a loss to name it all. Must be some kind of museum, she whispered in awe. Nobody uses this sort of stuff nowadays. Perhaps it belongs to one of the big breweries, said Caroline, who was fingering a dazzling array of driving bits. You know, the one that still use horses. Maybe, said Madge, but most of their stables are in the city, and anyway this looked more like working farm harness than the kind the brewers use. Madge shivered, suddenly aware of being very cold. Come on, she said briskly, let's go and find the owner of this place. We can ask him what it all means, preferably over a hot cup of tea. Caroline nodded, the two girls made their way back to the yard and began to look around for the farmhouse. They found it nestling in the middle of an orchard of twisted apple trees, a low rambling building that crouched in the mist like a sleeping cat. From one tall spiral chimney a thin trickle of smoke rose to thicken the surrounding mist. Except for this the house looked completely deserted. Madge and Caroline stood hesitated at the nail-studded door, neither one of them having the carriage to knock. What if there's no one in? whispered the younger girl. There must be, Madge replied. What about the smoke? Anyway, we'll never find out if we keep standing here in the dark. With these brave words, Madge stepped forward and grasped the enormous iron fox's mask that hung above the letterbox. Then, with trembling hands, she rapped three times on the weather-beaten wood. The door swung open, as if by magic. It revealed a long, dark passage with a dim glow of light at the far end. Hello? Anyone at home? called Madge in a shaky voice. There was no answer, but from somewhere far off came the slow, steady ticking of a clock. I'm not going in there, said Caroline, and she began to back away. But Madge, knowing how desperate was their need for food and shelter, pushed her on. The passage smelt of musty leather and dogs. On the dark panelled walls hung hunting prints and sepia coloured photographs in gloomy groups. Groups. Madge shivered as her boots rang on the echoing stone floors, but she pressed resolutely on and was soon pushing back a heavy bead curtain that divided the passage from the light. The girls found themselves in what could only be the farmhouse kitchen. A huge fire of apple logs roared in the wide grate, and this, coupled with two old-fashioned oil lamps, gave the whole room a warm, rosy glow, like the inside of a pearly shell. Caroline yawned, stretched, and plonked herself down in a chair by the blazing fire. All her fears were bathed away by the comfortable atmosphere that oozed from every corner of the bright kitchen. Madge felt happier too and began to look around for the farmer or his wife, whose domain she guessed this to be. But her loudly shouted hello still remained unanswered. They're probably out rounding up the sheep or something, said Caroline, steaming gently in the heat. Oh, do let's put the kettle on and find some food. I'm starving. Surely they won't mind if we help ourselves. Her companion, whose stomach had just begun to rumble in the most peculiar way, had to agree. They found the larder easily enough and raided cool dark shelves for milk, tea, eggs and bacon. 
The milk, which tasted as if it had just come from the cow, was stored in brown earthenware jugs, while the tea came from a very elegantly fluted silver caddy, complete with key. They really believe in doing things the old-fashioned way, don't they? exclaimed Caroline. And she also discovered that all the cooking had to be done on an open range beside the fire. I'm sure your idea about this being some kind of museum was right. Compared to this kitchen, my mother's would look like the operations room at Kate Kennedy. Well, they don't even seem to have a fridge, she added in disgust. Two girls had great fun creating a meal in the, with the antiquated utensils they found. Even the kettle, which proved to be full of water, had to be swung on the end of a kind of iron crane so that it could be boiled over the fire. Luckily, Caroline had her guide's badge for preparing a campfire meal, and so they didn't do too badly. Although, in their hungry state, they probably would have eaten everything raw if they had to. When they finished, they stacked all the crockery into an old iron tub, which looked vaguely as if it was used for washing up, and settled back to awaste, await their absent hosts. No one came. The hours passed, and soon Caroline was snoringly asleep. Madge, however, couldn't relax. She kept waiting for the bang of a door or the bark of a dog. Anything, in fact, which would herald the arrival of the farmer. But still, nobody came. Another thing too kept her awake, for the hanging, hanging on the wall opposite the chair in which she was sitting was a strange portrait of a young girl. There was something disturbing about the pale face and the wide green eyes in the picture, something that didn't seem to fit with the prim black dress the figure was wearing, something both willful and wild. Madge found herself staring at the painting as though hypnotised and had to force herself to look away. But even as she sunk into a fitful dream, the expression in those sad green eyes continued to haunt her. She woke to find the kitchen bathed in the translucent, pearly light of morning, but the mist still hadn't completely cleared. Caroline slept on in the other chair, but except for her there was no other sign of human life at all. Oh, they can't have come back yet, Madge yawned, and she rose to take a look out of the clouded window. Suddenly she heard a noise behind her, but it was only Caroline waking up. She looked white and her eyes had blue-black rings under them. I had a horrible nightmare she said in a shaky voice. I can't remember what it was about, only I'm sure it was something to do with his house. Anyway, she added, gathering up the skirts of her crumpled neck curtain, I'm getting out of here now. That car track must lead back to the main road. I'll follow it down and try and thumb a lift to London. London? Madge was horrified. You're still not thinking of going to the pop festival, are you? I thought you'd forgotten all about it. Well, I haven't, the other pouted. I want to go and no one's going to stop me. With that, she turned towards the door. The crash which followed seemed to shake the whole house. Madge and Caroline spun round like startled rabbits, only to see the portrait of the girl shattered on the floor. It was all too much for their fragile nerves, and in an instant they fled. Herring down the echoing corridor towards the front entrance, Caroline was convinced that light footsteps were following them, and she nearly had a heart attack when the heavy oak door refused to open. Luckily, her companion ceded by brute force to wrench it open, and they both tumbled out into the yard. Quick! yelled Madge, who had been infected by the other girl's panic. Let's get Jester, we'll ride double! So, all in the space of five minutes, poor Jester found himself hauled out of the stable, saddled up, and flying down the path with two trembling riders clinging to his back. He didn't get time to protest about galloping into the wall of mist, but he was being driven on regardless. Happily, though, for all their safety, the weather began to clear a little, and soon the horse was see able to see where he was heading. Look over there, cried Madge after a while. Isn't that the place where I first saw you? Yes, replied Caroline. And there's a man standing there in the mound. He's holding my guitar. The man turned out to be Tom Tallis, an old and crotchety shepherd who had lived and worked on the moors for years. Accustomed as he was to odd sights, he was fabergasted to see two dishevelled females riding towards him. But he recovered slightly on recognising the one in the net curtain gown. Yeah, I'm Caroline Crowe, ain't you? He mumbled when they rode up. I seen your photograph in the local paper. Are ye still lost? For an answer, the builder's daughter collapsed in a fit of hysterical laughter. Old Tom Tallis eyed her warily. Yeah, I'm better bring her to my hut, he told Madge. This seems to have turned her head. Madge had a horrible suspicion he could be right. The old shepherd's hut wasn't far away, 
and consisted of a little corrugated iron shack built in a hollow between three small hills. He poured them all out cups of hot sweet cocoa made with condensed milk, and when the two girls had recovered somewhat, asked them what had happened to make him so upset. Caroline seemed anxious to unburden herself of the eerie story, and Madge let her tell it, even though she did think the younger girl made it sound like a horror story. Tom Tallis, however, was very impressed. I reckon the place you went to must have been five ways for him, he said, after Caroline had finished. He used to be owned by a man called Fred Sutherhill about fifty years ago. Fred made a false small fortune carrying goods over more in horse-drawn wagons. None of those lorries are new that day, you see. Anyways, as I said, Five Ways Farm was a flourishing place then. They reckon Fred used to keep overshoot thirty shy horses. All great. Colour was a kind of trademark. Although he was, had so much, he wasn't a happy man. He had no son to carry on business, see. Had a daughter, though. Flighty little piece she were. But old Fred worshipped the ground she walked on. Then one day she ran off to the big city, and it broke her father's heart. Let the whole farm fall to rack and ruin and the business with it. Horses were sold off, then the land. Finally, when he died, Tom just stood empty and rotted. They could never trace his daughter, you see. Then for bad company, that was the last anyone heard of her. And you think we spent the night at Five Ways Farm, put in Madge. But, but that's impossible. The house we were in certainly wasn't a ruin. Or are you implying that we've been seeing ghosts? Tom Tallis winked and says, I ain't saying anything, only that I don't know of another farm in that direction. You'd better make up your own minds about it. Oh, I have, whispered Caroline, looking rather pain. I certainly have. Later, when the mist had completely cleared, Tom pointed the way to Amber, and even went so far as to accompany them part of the journey. Caroline was strangely silent as they walked along, and didn't once mention her trip to London or the pop festival. In fact, she even left her guitar in Tom's hut, but she didn't seem to miss it or even notice that it was gone. Just outside the village they met the police patrol who were about to start their search again, and who should be with them but Dan Crowborough himself. He was utterly overjoyed to see his daughter again, even more so because she actually seemed pleased to see him. After hearing a censored version of their adventures, the two girls had mutually agreed to cut out all mention of Five Ways Farm. He extended his welcome to include Madge as well. You saved my little girl, he blurted out. Whatever can I do to thank you? Well, for a start, replied the owner of Applegate rather cynically, you can't see your plans to build over my riding school. Dan Crober looked a bit embarrassed. You'll have to forgive me that little misunderstanding, he said. Fact is, I was only trying to pay you back for what happened at your show last month. I doubt if we'll get final planning permission anyway, because I think that's area is supposed to be green land. Madge was indignant. Do you mean I've been worrying all this time for nothing? Look, I am sorry, property developer said humbly. I know, how about letting me put up some cash towards a new indoor school for your stables? Yours is an expanding business, you're sure to want one sooner or later. My firm can handle the building side for you, and that will help cut the cost. An indoor school for Applegate had been Madge's dream ever since she'd first inherited the place. That would be wonderful, she told Mr Crowborough, with a beaming smile. And whatever Caroline wants to come and ride at our stables, she'll be more than welcome to do so. I'll take you up on that, laughed Caroline, who had just come up leading gesture. I've got a feeling I'll be concentrating on horse shows rather than pop festivals in the future. And for that, I'll need all the teaching and practice I can get. She was as good as her word. Madge was amazed at the change that had come over the girl, and was inclined to put it ha down to the ghostly happenings of the haunted house. Those strange events continued to puzzle her, until one day she at last got the truth. She and Tom were visiting Paddy Brogan's horse-dealing yard one day, when two very artfully dressed people arrived. They were looking, they said, for several young cart horses. They had just started up a centre hiring out horse-drawn gypsy caravans to people who wanted, quote, a holiday with a difference, unquote. They bought an old farm horse from the walls, then up the stabling, purchased several genuine caravans from Ireland, but still had too few horses to pull them. How many would you be wanting? said the dealer, with a gleam in his eye. About seven in assorted colours of horse, beamed the arty lady. 
Paddy blessed his patron saint because he just happened to have in his sleeve at that moment a few ha hairy, ugly brutes that would never sell as riding horses. I'll bring you all for a selection, he said with a grin. Now if you just tell me the name of your farm and where it's at. Pideways Farm, your Amber Le Leckington Moor, said the lady. But that's impossible, Madge broke in, astounded. I was told not three days ago the farm was a ruin. Well, dear, and so it was, replied the arty lady. Until my husband and I took it over last June, he retired from his London business then, so we had plenty of money to put it right. But we wanted to keep the Victorian atmosphere of the house, kind of living museum, you see, where people could recapture the true spirit of the past before they go out in their genuine nineteenth-century caravans. The light was beginning to dawn on Madge. You haven't by any chance got a painting in your kitchen? A portrait of a girl with green eyes, she asked. Why, yes, laughed the lady. How on earth did you know that? It was an old picture we found in the attic. It was the previous owner's daughter, I believe. Unfortunately, it was smashed by some tramps who broke into the house one night while my husband were out looking for horses when they got lost in that dreadful mist. Madge swallowed hard and went very red, but decided not to say anything about her exploits that night. Besides, Highway's Farm might be haunted after all. So, <clears throat> Madge and Caroline end up safe, and Caroline is reunited with her family. All's well that ends well. Watch out for the next chapter of Applegate. Bye for now. Hello, I'm Melanie, here with another chapter from Applegate by Fiona Citron. So, in the last chapter, Madge and Caroline Crowbra spent the night in a farm which they thought was haunted, but turned out not to be, and Caroline was reunited with her father, who no longer wants to build over Applegate stables, which is good. So, let's see what they get up to next in chapter 12. Madge buys a rogue. Paddy Brogan's horse stealing yard lay at the bottom of a windy hollow just off the main road. It was a rather ramshackle place with odd sheds and stables springing up like mushrooms around a small farmhouse which served the Irishman as a home. A horseman who went by strict cavalry manual rules would have despised such an establishment. The Madge Summers rather enjoyed her visits there. Everything was so informal and besides that, there was the constant excitement of new horses to see and ride, even if you couldn't always afford to buy them. Therefore, as she was going past one day on her way to Grandpa's horse day sales, she decided to turn into Paddy's in the hope he would be able to produce some suitable animals and so save her journey. To her disappointment, however, the yard was deserted. Parking the Land Rover and trailer, she alighted and began to search around for the owner, but no luck. There were plenty of horses, though, all shapes and sizes, from scraggy mountain ponies to elegant high-class hunters. One of them, a young skewball mare with a hog mane, caught her eye in particular, and she had just opened the box door for a closer look when a stream of Irish oaths turned the air to brimstone. Madge straightened up so quickly that she nearly knocked herself out on the mare's chin. Whatever can be the matter? she thought, trying to trace the source of the wild language still echoing round the yard. Paddy Brogan doesn't usually swear like that. Intrigued, she traced the sound to a large shed which housed the Irishman's two horse transporters. Yes, the noise was certainly coming from in there. It sounded though as battle was taking place, for she recognised several other voices beside the dealers, and above them all the high-pitched screaming of a maddened animal. Madge could stand it so no longer, she had to find out what was going on. Grasping one of the rickety doors firmly by its handle, she pushed the all her might and almost fell into the huge shed. At first she was aware of nothing but musty twilight, then suddenly someone gave a harsh yell of warning, and the darkness exploded around her into fire and stars. She came round to find herself sitting outside the shed with Paddy Brogan trying to force a glass of water between her dry lips. What happened? Madge murmured in a shaky voice. What hit me? The mare! It was the mare! Paddy's voice sounded even more shaken than hers. I swear to you, Miss Summers, she just pulled the rope right out of my hand! Madge was confused. What mare? she inquired. Do you mean there was a horse in the shed? The Irishman nodded. Indeed, and it's still there, only some would call it a devil rather than a horse. It's the mare I bought of Colin Wellen, he added. You know, the famous show jumper. Well, I thought I had a bargain, the mare being grade A and all that, but I soon found out different. Colin Wellen? asked Madge in a puzzled tone, but I thought he was in hospital. 
Sure he is. And wasn't it the mare who put him there? Paddy shook his head sadly. Two broken legs and a fractured skull. If I'd known that black harpy was responsible at the time, I never would have bought her. But a grade A show jumper is difficult to turn down, especially at the low price Mr. Welland was asking. What's the horse's name? asked Madge, who was beginning to recover a little. I know most of Colin Welland's horses, but I didn't think he owned a black mare. Starfire, at least that was her name before he bought her, Paddy replied. You may remember when she was ridden by Caroline Davis. Welland bought her after Miss Davis got married and gave up the jumping. And he christened the horse Original Sin, which I think suits her down to the ground. Madge still looked puzzled. You say this horse is a killer, but the Starfire I remember was one of the best horses out. Surely an animal can't change that quickly. Or was it Colin Welland himself who turned her into a rogue? I've heard about his training methods, and they don't make very pretty listening. But Paddy wouldn't commit himself. There have been rumours, he agreed, but it still doesn't change the fact that the mare is vicious. I thought I could quieten her down, but I failed. I'm sending her to the only place suitable for vicious horses, the knackers. As if in answer to this stern silence, there came a frantic hammering and battering from the inside of the door. The animal's insane! cried one of Paddy's helpers as he swiftly backed away. She's likely to click the door down and kill us all if we got to give her the chance. Paddy, however, was not to be taken. Now that's no way to talk, Mitchell, he said. The mare must be got into the halt box and taken down to the slaughterers by tonight. Where is your fighting spirit? If poor Mitchell ever had a fighting spirit, which was highly unlikely, he certainly didn't have it with him at that point. However, he was saved in the nick of time by Madge. She just couldn't bear to think of a marvellous horse like Starfire coming to such a degrading end, and she made up her mind to do something about it. Paddy, she asked, greatly daring, how much would you take for the black mare? I'd give you a better price than the knacker would. At first, Paddy was stunned. Then he threw back his head and roared with laughter. You mean you want to buy that horse after all you've heard about it? You must be joking. What would you do with a horse, a horse like that? Throw your enemies to it, like the Roman circus. Of course not. It just seems such a waste, that's all. And I think I could quieten the horse down, at least for long enough to let you deliver her to my stables. How? I'm not telling you until you promise to sell her to me. Paddy scratches ear thoughtfully. All right, he said at last. If your scheme works, you can have the mare. But don't blame me if you break your neck in the attempt. Madge's plan was simple. In the back of a Land Rover, she had a few packets of powder given to her by Billy Hackett's great-grandmother, which were in fact a kind of mild drug. One pinch was enough to make any horse sleepy. She fetched the powder and then, under Paddy's cynical gaze, stirred a little bit of it into a bucket of water. Just push that through the door, she said, and I guarantee that within ten minutes the mare would be as quiet as a kitten. Paddy and his henchmen were utterly astonished when, on once again going into the shed, they found the black horse staggering around like a day-old car. She was no trouble to get into the box, and when a hundred and fifty pounds had changed hands, the Irishman could not help but congratulate Madge on his strategy. You'll have no trouble with her now, he said. The only thing is, where do you want me to take her? If I know that partner of yours, you won't take too kindly to a neurotic mare wandering round the riding school. Madge agreed this was a problem and in the end instructed Paddy to drop off the mare to small field near the common. This field had been rented by Applegate Stables to provide extra winter grazing, but it wasn't due to be used till after Christmas. Should be all right in there, said Madge. Tom never goes near the place, nor for that matter did anyone else. Perhaps left on her own for a while, she might just come back to her senses. So, Madge saved a horse from being put down. Will it be worth it? Will the mare come right? Will she injure anybody else in the process? Find out next time. Bye for now. Hello, I'm Melanie. I'm here with another chapter from Applegate by Fiona Citron. In the last chapter, we saw Madge Summers buy what was called a rogue horse that had injured some people, which she couldn't bear to see put down. So let's see what happens next. In chapter 13, the Phantom Cavalier. Later that evening, Madge made her way secretly to the field to see just how well her new purchase had settled down. 
She was pleased to see that the black mare had fully recovered from her dose of sedative and was grazing quietly in the fading sunlight, her black cloak coat glistening as she moved unhurriedly about the field. Why, well, she doesn't look vicious at all, she thought as she climbed over the gate. She was probably just fighting back at Paddy's. Perhaps she'd even let me stroke her. Madge never got that near. The black mare seemed to sense her presence before she was halfway across the field. With a piercing scream of fury, the horse threw up her snake-like head and charged. It was like standing in the path of an express train. Madge threw herself sideways, but not before a gleaming set of yellow teeth had torn the shoulder out of her jacket. Almost sobbing with fear, she picked herself up and ran for the gate, while behind her came the maddened thunder of steel-shod hooves. Luckily the gate was near, and by a zigzagging course, Mad Madge managed to get under it just before the mare flung herself at it. For a terrifying second she thought the gate wouldn't hold, but it did, and at last, weary from battering the solid old plank oak planks, the mare turned away and retreated to the other side of the paddock. Shaking like a leaf, Madge called back home. When she reached the cottage, Tom had already gone, but Anna was there, and Madge felt she just had to tell someone about everything that had happened. The Dutch girl listened quietly and finally suggested that the black mare should be left alone for a while to settle down in her new surroundings. It was no good to keep upsetting an animal like that, she said. Better to forget it till after Christmas. There was plenty of shelter and water in the field, and they could both take turns at going down and putting in some hay. In the next few weeks, the young owner of Applegate had little time to worry about her new horse. With the completion of the indoor school, work at the stables had increased a hundredfold, and Madge had hardly had time to breathe, let alone go down to see the black mare. One day, however, she decided to plan one of her hacks so that it ran by original sin's paddock, telling herself that the riders liked going to the common anyway, and that that route was as quick as any. Sunday was always a busy time at Applegate, with every horse fully booked from nine o'clock in the morning to five at night. Jester, Madge's own horse, was usually commandeered to help out on the advanced lessons, and so she was forced to borrow one of the livery's mounts to take her hack on. The one she chose was Joan Warwick's new horse, Merlin. Joan was away for the weekend, and so Madge felt she could use him without feeling guilty. Now, she said when everyone was settled, I thought we'd go to the common today. To her surprise, a strange silence greeted this suggestion. Madge was puzzled. Usually the children loved to ride to the common, but common meant plenty of galloping, a pace they weren't often allowed to indulge in. Well, she said, noting the expressions on their faces, what's the matter? You always seem to be complaining because we don't go there often enough, and now I'm offering to take you, you're about as enthusiastic as if I suggested a road hack around the estate. It, it's not that we don't want to go, Miss Summers, said one girl in a slightly ashamed voice. Um... We do, it, it's just... Just what? questioned Madge sharply. The girl swallowed, glanced around her nervously, and continued in a whisper. Well, there have been stories about a ghost. A ghost? said Madge. I've never heard anything so silly. But the spokeswoman of the riders wasn't to be dissuaded. There is a ghost, she insisted, on the common. Two girls from my school sort when they were going home one evening. They said it was a kind of headless horseman that galloped by them in the dark. And they're not the only ones, she said, on seeing Madge's sceptical expression. Someone wrote to the local paper about it last week, a vicar I think he was. He said it was the spirit of a cavalier killed in the Civil War. And you believe this? For an answer, the children seemed to huddle their horses together like a troop of nervous sheep. Madge felt quite sorry for them. Oh, all right, she said at last, trying to laugh the whole matter off. If you're really that frightened, we'll go to the woods. And turning Merlin's head, she rode out to the yard. Gratefully, the children followed her. One evening, Madge was all alone at the stables when she heard the noise of galloping hooves thundering down the drive. She was frozen to petrified stillness as the hoof pates came nearer and nearer. Tales of the ghost came flooded to her mind. What if the stories had been true? And it was coming now. What had done doing confronted by a headless horseman? Then there was the rattling of sharp stones on metal, and whatever it was careered into the yard. Madge, Madge! yelled an angry voice. I've just seen the ghost rider! It was Joan Warwick. She had taken Merlin out late that afternoon after finishing work. Now she stood in the middle of the yard, holding the sweating grey and trembling like a leaf. It was horrible, she said. 
not giving the older girl a chance to speak. I was riding on the common when suddenly this awful looking thing came charging out of the dust towards me. I didn't see it all the clay, but I could have sworn it was the cavalier. Oh, not that again, said Madge. Really, Joan, it's bad enough when the children start believing in spooks. I didn't think you'd be so silly. I'm not being silly, cried Joan. I honestly did see something out there. Whether it was a ghost or not, I couldn't say, but it was certainly terrifying. Merlin here felt it too. He's never moved that fast in his life before. That doesn't prove anything. He's probably just scented your fear. This unbelieving attitude, Joan was near to tears, and seeing this, Madge relented a little. Now, don't take on so, she said. Directly Tom gets back with a lesson, I'll send him up to the common in the Land Rover. Perhaps he'll be able to discover what frightened you. Tom, when he heard what had happened, thought it was all a huge joke. Never fear, ladies, he said, sweeping his hat off in mock gallantry. I will protect you. Tom Palmer, ghost hunter extraordinaire is my name. Guaranteed to frighten away werewolves with one look. Madge said that with his face that was entirely possible, and with a laughing reply Tom set out on his journey to meet the unknown. He wasn't laughing when he came back. Joan and Madge were sitting in the office where there was a squeal of brakes and Tom flung himself from the Land Rover looking as pale as a sheet. You never saw it, said his partner, helping him to a chair. Don't tell me there really is a ghost. Tom took a long swig, hot tea, but when he put the cup down his hands were still shaking. I still can't believe it, he said. I could have sworn, but no, it can't possibly be true. What happened? Well, I was driving across the common across that track that leads to the pond when I saw this thing coming towards me. It was coming out of the dark and it seemed to be, well, glowing. Then it must have seen the jeep because suddenly it turned round and vanished. Vanished? Yes, vanished. I still can't believe it myself. I mean, it's just not possible to see ghosts in this day and age, is it? After that trembling confession, Tom refused to discuss the matter any more, and when Madge tackled him about it the next day, he put the whole experience down to the kippers he had for tea, saying they must have been off and blamed them for causing delusions. Madge wasn't to be put off as easily as that. She was determined to get to the bottom of the matter once for all and for all. It is bad for business to have ghosts wandering round in most popular rides, for rumour was rife, and already people were cancelling bookings rather than be taken on hacks over the common. So, late the next afternoon, she saddled up Jester and set out on the trail of the headless cavalier. By the time they reached the calm and the moon had risen, a great round disc of silver had swam through the night like an enchanted galleon. Madge followed it with her eyes as it dipped and glided behind the trees. Well, at least there'll be plenty of light, she thought. All was quiet. Only a thin breeze floated between the skeleton branches of the bushings with a dry rustling sound. An owl hooted like a lost soul from the other side of the park. Inadvertently, Madge began to shiver and pulled her, th her thick sheepskin jacket closer around her shoulders. The world seemed so empty. The bright lights and car noises of Ferrybridge Newtown could have belonged to a different age, for in the middle of the dark common, time seemed to stand still. I'm not staying here for long, she thought to herself, easing her horse into the shelter of some trees. This place gives me the creeps. The ghost doesn't turn up soon. I'm going home. Almost as the word left her lips, however, there came the soft drumming of a horse's hooves. Madge hadn't had her riding hat on. Her hair would have stood straight up like the bristles on a wire brush. For out of the shifting purple shadows, a glowing shape was coming swiftly towards her. It was the ghost rider, there was no mistaking that. Under the broad-brimmed hat with the sweeping feathers, there was an empty space until a wide lace collar showed white against the darkness. A headless rider. Madge gave a long shudder, then forced herself to think sensibly. There was only one way to prove if this phantom was real or not, and that was to tackle it. But how? The strange cavalier obviously hadn't noticed the girl lurking in the bushes, for he steered his ghostly horse past her and down the track that led to the woods. As she saw her quarry escaping, Madge made up her mind. Taking Jester firmly in hand, she dug her heels in and set him thundering after the retreating hoofbeats. Nearer and nearer the Chester drew to the glowing spectre that raced before him, until his rider could almost touch the floating insubstantial tail. Then suddenly the headless cavalier must have realised that he was being followed. For with a strangled cry he spurred his horse forward and the chase was on in earnest. 
They thundered onwards at a pace which froze the brain, but left fear curdling in the pit of the stomach. What would she do if she actually caught up with the ghostly cavalier? She hadn't stopped to think. All she knew that was somehow she had to keep going at this breakneck pace or lose her quarry for good. Jester, however, was now feeling the strain. His breathing was becoming laboured, and his nostrils showed like pools of blood in the darkness. Suddenly he lost his footing altogether and stumbled heavily, nearly throwing his rider to the ground. Madge somehow kept him upright, but she knew it would be both foolish and cruel to ask him to go on for much longer. Then she saw the park railings glittering metallically in the moonlight, and she knew that she had won. Iron spikes six foot high would stop even a stag. No horse would attempt that jump in the dark, and if the phantom cavalier got through that, it would prove he was a ghost once and for all. Easily she began to pull Jester up. But the other horse didn't stop. Instead, it actually increased its stride. Madge watched with horror as it collected itself for the jump. No, it's impossible, she thought. No horse could. But it did. The great muscles of its hindquarters bunched and then catapulted it high into the air. The girl screamed but couldn't drag her eyes away from the death or glory struggle of the ghost rider and his horse. It was like watching a horror film in slow motion. For a fraction of a second, the black silhouette was etched against the moonlit sky and underneath the frosty sparkle of the iron railings. Then, with a flick of its heels, the horse was over and Madge was able to breathe again. But her relief was short-lived, for seconds later there came a slithering crash and a short yelp of pain. So it isn't a ghost. Almost as the words were out of her mouth, Madge was off the chestnut and running towards the railings. To her right was an old gnarled oak tree, which lay half against the fence. She shinned, this up with a fine, shinned up this with a fine disregard for her clothes and managed to swing out over the iron spikes and drop down by way of a handy branch to the other side. The figure lay still on the grass with the dark shadow of a horse hovering above it. As Madge approached, the horse moved off but halted at a safe distance and watched her with baleful eyes. It was sweating and the girl noticed how the luminous glow that surrounded it was getting fainter as the damp patches on its coat grew. I bet that's phosphorescent paint, she murmured. And if I'm any judge, that's what's making the cavalier shine too. But there was still something very eerie about the prone body of the cavalier and as she approached it, a cold shiver raced down Madge's spine. What if he really is a ghost? She thought. Surely no person would dress like a dress up like that and ride around the countryside. And after all, there was a battle fought near here in the Civil War. But now curiosity was replacing fear, and, unable to help herself, Madge was drawn nearer. Who is the Phantom Cavalier? you have to wait till next time to find out. Bye for now. Hello, I'm Melody, here with another chapter from Applegate by Fiona Citroen. So, in the last chapter, Madge had chased the Phantom Cavalier across the moors. The Phantom Cavalier's horse had jumped the railings, but then the Cavalier had fallen off and was lying on the ground. And as we left it, Madge was approaching the ghostly figure. So, let's find out who it was. In Chapter 14, A Secret and a New Start. The ghost rider lay on his face with the gaudy plumes of his hat blowing gently in the night wind. Madge knelt and very gingerly placed a hand on the blue velvet doublet. The ghost rider, as if conscious of the touch, groaned and rolled over, and as they did so, the black mask that they were wearing slipped off. Anna! Madge gasped. So it was you all along. How she ever managed to get Anna back to the stables is still a mystery to Madge. She remembered trying to lift the Dutch girl onto the phosphorescent horse's saddle, but the animal would have none of it, and raced away into the darkness. They then followed a long walk to the only gate in that line of fence, and then an even longer walk on the other side back to Jester. Anna seemed only half conscious during this time, and the other girl didn't dare question her about the ghost rider in case it upset her even more. At last, after an incredibly tiring journey across the common and back along the roads, the bedraggled little party reached Applegate Cottage. To Madge's utter relief, Tom had been waiting up for her, and she gratefully passed Anna over to him while she sought the exhausted jester. Tired though she was, Madge rubbed him down, gave him extra straw, and filled his water bucket in hay net before she finally allowed herself to crawl back to the warmth of the house. When she arrived inside, Anna was sitting propped up in the chair with a glass of brandy in her trembling hands, while Tom stood above her, looking very angry indeed. She absolutely refuses to tell me what had happened, he said angrily. It's my belief that she was trying to frighten people away from the stables dressing up like that. 
Perhaps someone's paying her to ruin our business. Oh, don't be so melodramatic, said Madge. Anna wouldn't do a thing like that. Let me talk to her. By now, the Dutch girl was hotly denying Tom's allegations and tears were streaming down her face. It wasn't like that at all, she sobbed. It was all because of original sin. Original sin? Tom and Madge echoed together. Yes, the black mare that Miss Summers brought from Paddy Brogan. You remember, Miss Summers, how you said no one could get near her? Well, I went down to the field one day and got her to make friends. Then I slowly managed to get a bridle and saddle on her, and after that started to school her. It was quite easy, really. I think the mare had been badly knocked about by that last person who rode her, and had just lost confidence in people. She only needed sympathetic handling. But, but that's incredible, said Tom. I thought when you came here you couldn't ride much because of your back. Now you're trying to tell us that you tamed some imaginary killer horse. Um, original sin isn't an imaginary horse, said Madge rather guiltily. I did buy her off Paddy Brogan, but I never got round to telling you about it. Still, that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that Anna managed to school her well enough to jump the common railings. That's what I call genius. Tom, however, looked confused. But what about all this ghost rider nonsense, he said. Why dress up like a cavalier just to school a horse? Because I didn't know I ought to know anyone to know what I was doing, said Anna in a small voice. I thought Miss Summers might be angry because I told her I couldn't ride when I could. That's why I only took the black mare out at night. I thought the clavalier clothes that I kept after the riding club pageant might scare people off from finding my secret. I still don't understand, said Madge, who now looked as puzzled as Tom. Why did he tell me you couldn't ride in the first place? But Anna wouldn't answer, and they all decided to leave things as they were until the morning when the matter could be investigated further. Morning came, but Anne what still wasn't very forthcoming. Instead, she still seemed very worried about Original Sin, who was still loose on the common. So, after breakfast, Madge and Tom saddled the two horses and went to look for the truant black mare. For nearly two hours they wandered around the heath, but not a sign of a horse could they find. Madge was now beginning to share Anna's anxiety. What if the mare had wandered onto the road, she thought, or broken a leg or something? Luckily, her fears were groundless, for well, just as they were giving up all hope, there came a sharp clip-clop of hooves along the track, and who should come round the corner but Paddy Brogan, leading original sin. Madge sighed with relief and rushed over to see if the mare was all right. Tom came with her and expressed an admiration for the black horse, who now stood groomed and gleaming in the sun. She's a beauty, he said. Paddy beamed. She is that, he replied. Only you wouldn't have thought so if you had seen her when you trotted into my yard this morning. Never seen a horse in such a state in all my life. Looked as though she'd had a bucket of paint thrown over her. You ought to be more careful with a top-class mare like this. Top-class, echoed Tom. I thought Madge bought her to save it from being put down. Paddy grinned. So she did. But that still doesn't change the fact that the mare was once an international show jumper. And, by the way, he added, talking about her past career, I had a call from the Great Metropolitan Horse Show Committee. Seems that Colin Wellen entered the mare for several competitions and never cancelled the entry fields, so they want to know if she's still going to compete. I could have told them no straight away, but as you're her no owner, I thought you ought to know and give your permission. Madge promised to ring them directly when they got home, and taking original t sin in tow, she and Tom, Tom started back to Applegate. On the way, they happened to pass the iron railings over which the black mare had made a heroic jump the night before. Tom was most impressed and insisted on dismounting and measuring the leap with a tape he had on him. That's over six feet high, he gasped, and the mare must have stood back a good five feet to clear it. No wonder Colin Welland entered her for the big show. Then suddenly a calculating look came into his eye. I wonder, he said, if Anna really can ride the horse, I don't see why we shouldn't let her take an original sin and went to one of the great metropolitan competitions. After all, if she can jump six foot of strike railing, she can jump just about anything. Madge thought he was joking at first, but then began to realise the scheme might work. After all, she thought, original sin was definitely much quieter. Perhaps Anna's patient schooling had done the trick. But, she said aloud, what will Anna think of the idea? The only one way to find out, said Tom, and that's to ask her. Back at the cottage, Anna's first reaction was just as Madge had suspected. 
The Dutch girl wouldn't dream of, dream of riding under any circumstances. Tom, however, was loath to give up the idea and through a mixture of charm, bribery and bullying, managed at least to, get a, to give a demonstration on original sin in the paddock. If Madge had been impressed by the back mare's leap over the park railing, she was absolutely astonished when the horse performed over the coloured jumps. Nothing seemed too big or too wide or too tricky for the mare and her young rider to get over. Tom even went so far as to build the wall up to nearly seven feet and original sin cleared it. At last they called a halt and Anna dismounted, looking flushed but happy. You can't refuse to enter the show now, Tom told her. It wouldn't be fair on the horse. Original Sin deserves to make a comeback, and I think with you on her back, she could do it. With a shaky smile, Anna agreed. The Great Metropolitan Horse Show was held in London at the end of November. It was the last big indoor event of the season, and so attracted all the most glittering names in world show jumping. Because of this, Tom had quite a lot of difficulty getting Anna accepted as the rider, but at last he succeeded, and everything was fixed to her, for her to compete in the Young Riders Challenge Trophy on the first day of the show. That day came all too quickly for Anna, and for Madge too, but for different reasons. Anna had been looking forward to the day with increasing dread, while Madge began to doubt if six months would be long enough for all the preparations she had to make. Apart from arranging with someone to run the sables while she and Tom were away, she also had to buy a new tap for Original Sin, work at a route to London, and book a hotel for the night after the show. That was without filling in the piles of forms sent by the Show Jumping Association, and helping steady the Dutch girl's nerves at the same time. So, Anna is going to take original sin and jump in the Young Riders Cup. How will she do? Find out next time. Bye for now. Hello, I'm Melanie, and I'm here with the final chapter of Applegate by Fiona Citron. In the previous chapter, we found out who the Phantom Cavalier was, and Anna is now going to take original sin to the Great Metropolitan Horse Show, to try her hand at jumping in competition. So let's see how they get on in Chapter 15, Onward Alpagate. The last dog was ready, and one cold grey morning, Madge, Tom and Anna piled into the horse box with original sin behind and set off for the big city. It was an exciting journey. Mile after mile of rolling green countryside flashed by, broken now again by a sprawl of new houses, or on the horizon a sleepy little village, with its tall church spire showing dark against the slowly brightening sky. Nearer the city the fields stopped and the villages began to merge into one long housing estate. Now tall buildings began to dot the horizon, and they knew they were nearly there. The competitor's car park was crowded with more horse boxes and caravans than Madge had ever seen in her entire life. Above these, towering into the cloudy November sky, was the sports centre dome itself, a huge bubble of glass and steel. They all stared at it in amazement, and Anna summed up their feelings by gasping. But it looks so big! Original Sin was in a very bad mood after her long journey. Even Anna had difficulty in tying her and leading her down the ramp. With four feet on solid ground, however, the black mare calmed down a little. But all the way to her temporary stable, she danced and fidgeted around with her eyes on stalks. I wonder if she knows what she's here for, Madge said as Original Sin shied violently at a pile of coloured jumps. I hope she hasn't yet to upset before she goes into the ring. But for all their fears, they managed to get Original Sin to her billet without further mishap, and soon she was being fussed over like a grand duchess being made ready for a ball. She looks terrific, exclaimed Tom, standing back to get a good view of their creation. I bet she'd win the show hat class turned out like that, never mind the jumping. They all agreed with this, but then Anna suggested, more practically, that the mayor should be given some food and water and left in peace for a while. I'll stay with her, she added. For all the crowds coming and going outside, she might get a little panicky. This was welcomed as a good idea, and Tom and Madge slipped out quietly, leaving the two future competitors alone. Once outside the box, however, they decided to go their separate ways. Tom to the show secretary's office, where he would declare on his entry, while Madge slipped off to have a good look around the stables and showground. The acres of canvas stabling stretched from the faraway car park to the sports dome itself, and although it was still only the first day of the show, they already seemed packed with horses. Madge found them fascinating. The first performance of the day was set for two o'clock, and it was now one thirty. Therefore the place was alive with horses and people, making ready for their various classes. 
High-spirited show ponies with incredibly thin legs were being water-brushed and bandaged by agitated mothers and fathers, while their immaculately dressed young riders stood around criticising each other's mounts. Elegant ladies in side-saddle habits swept past with a string of grooms clattering at their heels, leading their equally elegant mounts. Added to add to the chaos, high-stepping hackneys were being trotted up and down the alley between the tents in an effort to loosen up their action before entering the ring. Suddenly Madge remembered that she'd arranged to meet Tom in the restaurant overlooking the ring just before the showing classes started. Tom was waiting when she arrived and they settled down to watch the working hunters who were now coming into the ring. There were twelve of them, splendid looking horses with flowing paces and beautiful manners. Poor Tom was quite put out by the sight of them, for they showed him how far Sky Dragon had to go before he could possibly reach that standard. But never mind, he comforted himself. At least Dragon can jump better than them. After the working hunter class came the show ponies, and after them the horses of the world display. Unfortunately, in the middle of this spectacular, Tom glanced down at his watch and discovered there was only an hour to go before Anna was due to compete in the Young Riders' Championship. Come on! he yelled, dragging the protesting Madge to her feet. We we'll have to leave now or we'll never get her into the ring on time. Hurriedly, they pushed their way out of the restaurant and set off for the stables. When they arrived, they found Anna in a terrible state of nerves. She was positively sick and kept fussing around the black mare with a brush, even though the horse's coat was polished, polished to an almost glass-like shine. Do calm down, advised Madge, taking the brush from the girl's trembling hand. It's no good getting all worked up before you even go into the arena. I know, Tom said. Why not ride the mare round the collecting ring for a bit? You'll feel better once you're on her back. Take her over a few jumps as well. Then you'll see for yourself you've got nothing to worry about. Reluctantly, Anna nodded, and original sin was quickly tacked up before the Dutch girl could change her mind. Once on board, though, Tom's words would prove true, and a little colour started to come back into her pale face. The black mare was also very excited to be amongst the sounds and sights of a big show again, and Anna found herself too busy trying to quieten her skittish steed to worry much about the competition. Madge and Tom led the way to the collecting ring, and then stood watching by the fence as Anna steered her way amongst the other riders. She had her mount under control now, and to prove it she put the black mare through her dressage repertoire to the delight of the crowd. Take her over the jump now, shouted Tom, who was delighted in seeing original Sin showing off her jumping ability. And Anna, who was almost enjoying herself now, obeyed. This will make them all sit up and take notice whispered Tom as the mare turned towards the high upright fence. She'll fly it. But he spoke too soon. The black horse was just getting into his stride when disaster struck. Within only a few feet of the jump, and just as she was about to gather herself up to take off, another horse cut straight in front, and an uncouth yell from its rider leapt over the fence before her. The rider was none other than Colin Wellen. Whether the mare was upset by her own enemy's voice or whether she has missed her stride will never be known. But whatever the reason, original Sin met the jump completely wrong and stopped dead, sending her eyes up hurtling into the middle of the poles like a bullet from a gun. Madge and Tom stood frozen as the timber collapsed around the girl, but luckily one of the other bystanders had more presence of mind. This was a German rider who leapt from his horse and pulled Anna clear, just as the massive upright posts toppled over and flared like with a crash on the place where she'd been lying. When Madge and Tom reached the spot, she was already sitting up, although she did seem only semi-conscious. Anna came round slowly. First the earth and sigh stopped changing places, and then gradually the faces of the people about her swam fuzzily into focus. Madge hovered worriedly. Are you all right? she asked. Do you want me to get the doctor? Anna didn't answer. But to everyone's utter amazement, she suddenly got to her feet, burst into tears, and ran towards the stables. I'll go after her, Madge said. She's probably just shaken by the fall. But somehow she knew the matter went deeper than that. She found Anna huddled in the corner of Original Sin's box, moaning. Now, come on, tell me all about it. Madge had decided to use the motherly approach. I think you owe some kind of explanation to the people outside. They all looked frightened to death when you ran off like that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, whispered Anna. Were they really upset? And then she suddenly broke down and told Madge the whole story. 
My name's not really Anna, she said, wiping her eyes with the back of her hand. It's Heidi von Maltese. Madge sat down rather heavily on a straw bale. Not Heidi von Maltese, the German Olympic rider, she said. Anna nodded. The very one. But what on earth were you doing in Applegate, and why did you say you were Dutch? I'm afraid I did mislead you, the other girl said with a watery smile. But I just had to get away to a place where nobody would know me. You see, just after the Olympics, I was jumping in the Grand Prix at Aachen. I was riding Ulan, the horse I'd won the bronze medal on at the Games. I remember we were coming down a big bank in the middle of the showground when suddenly I panicked. Why, I don't know, but it's a terribly steep slope and I suppose looking down. Anyway, I must have held his head too tight for him and he suddenly slipped and fell. I was all right, but Ulan had broken a leg. Here Anna, or rather Heidi, covered her face with her hands. I was so upset, she continued, speaking in a small voice through her tear-stained fingers. You see, not only had he helped me to win the bronze medal, but I'd had him for years, and he was more like a friend than a horse. After that, I completely lost my nerve for jumping. Everyone was very patient, but finally they had to drop me from the team. It was then I knew myself that I just had to get away and sort things out. But what made you choose my stables? Applegate? Oh, my mother, who is English, used to ride there once before she met my father and came to live in Germany. The owner used to be a friend of hers. Madge remembered the beautifully wrapped saddles in the loft and the story behind them. So that was Uncle Harry's girlfriend, she thought. Anyway, Heidi continued, I came to England and you know the rest. I told you I couldn't ride because at that time I was frightened to. But when I first saw Original Sin, I felt so sorry for the way she had been spoilt. I just had to try and school her back to her old form. And you did just that, said Madge. But why did you run off after that fall in the collecting ring? Don't say you've lost your nerve again. Heidi managed to smile. No, I haven't lost my nerve, or at least I don't think I have. It's just that I recognised the German rider who pulled me out of the jump, and I was worried that he might recognise me. Well, are you going to ride in this competition or not? Both girls swung round startled, only to be greeted by the sight of Tom Palmer standing in the doorway, holding original sin by the bridle. The collecting ring steward, he said huffily, has been calling your name for the last five minutes. There's only two more riders to go before it's your turn. For a moment, Heidi sat there wavering, and Madge knew that if she weren't pushed now, she would never ride again. Go on, she said, you can do it. Show them all that you and Sin are still internationals. To her relief, Heidi slowly stood up and crossed to take the bridle from Tom's hand. You're right, the girl said, almost to herself. I must go out there. But please, stay with me. I'll feel better somehow if you are watching. With Heidi mounted on the black mare, they made their way to the collecting ring and reached it just as the sewer was calling original Sin's name for the last and final time. Go on, whispered Tom as the fair girl hung back. It's now or never. But his encouragement wasn't needed, for directly original Sin saw the bright lights and jumps before her. She knew exactly what to do and trotted straight into the huge arena. Then followed the four most frustrating minutes in Madge's entire life. The crowd of riders, grooms and general hangers-on who were congregated around the entrance to the ring had opened out to admit Heidi, but now closed their ranks, completely cutting off the view into the arena. Tom tried to push her way through them, but it was no use. No one would budge an inch. We just have to wait it out here, he said, sitting down on a handy pile of brunch fences. And listen to the noises the crowd make. You can tell how she's doing from their cheers and groans. At first there was the usual rustling or whispering as the audience discussed the last competitor and tried to find the number of the new one in their catalogues. Then came a breathless hush as the bell rang and Heidi started on her way. A sigh of relief greeted her safe arrival over the first jump, for the crowd hated to see someone knock down the easiest fence on the course, and then silence as she successfully left the next three. Madge could tell there were three with a thud of the hooves as the black mare landed. But the fourth jump was different. This was the dreaded trick fence of the competition. 
By the plan of the course in her programme, Madge saw it was a narrow upright stile, set at a difficult angle to the gate just before it. She knew it was the trick fence by the sudden stirring amongst the audience as original sin approached. Then, for a long age it seemed, there was nothing to be heard but the indrawn breath of three thousand people. They let it out in a great sigh, followed by a burst of loud applause, and the girl waiting outside knew Heidi had made no mistake. It was at the fence after this, however, a huge spread of parallel pose. The Madge thought the German girl had had it. There was a great <gasps> from the watchers following a clattering of hooms on timber. A fence down? Luckily, no. The pose had merely leapt and rebounded into their sockets. Ah! <sighs> Went the crowd in relief. And so Heidi and Original Sin had a clear round and left the ring to the sound of tumultuous applause. Madge and Tom could hardly contain their delight. You did it! You did it! they both shouted as Anna Heidi rode up to them and slipped from her horse. We knew you would! To their surprise, however, Heidi looked rather gloomy. That was only the first round, she said, and I was so terrified I went like a snail. In the jump off, I'll have to go against the clock, and I don't think I can do it. Nonsense, Heidi, a voice with a heavy foreign accent suddenly said. You will go back in the other ring and jump splendidly, for if you're in, I will buy that black horse for you. Heidi said just one word. Papa! And then flung herself into the arms of the distinguished-looking man who had spoken. Later, after a long and happily tearful conversation in German, she broke off long enough to introduce him to Tom and Madge. This, says Heidi, is my father, Baron von Maltese, chef d'équipe of the German show jumping team. I have told him all about you and how you helped me and he is so grateful. You see, I have agreed to go back to Germany with him and continue my jumping career there. And I'd like to take original scene too, if you let me. Of course, my father would pay you very well for her, for she is such a brilliant animal. And Heidi then mentioned such an enormous amount of money that Tom nearly fainted on the spot. And so it was decided. Madge and Tom watched the rest of the competition from Baron von Maltese's special box. Heidi, riding for her life, won easily. A great relief to Tom, who thought the Baron might withdraw his offer if she didn't. Beating, to everyone's delight, Colin Wellen, who finished well down the line when the prizes were given out. After the show, the Baron threw a huge party to celebrate his daughter's return. Later, when they returned to the showgrounds to collect their horse box, they stopped by to say farewell and thank you to Original Sin. Tom leaned over the door and patted her still sleepy head. Then he showed her the cheque made out by the Baron. Not bad for an oak broken down horse, he said, jokingly as he waved it under her nose. Madge was just in time to save the cheque from being eaten. I'll take care of that, she said, prizing the piece of paper from between a double row of yellow teeth. That money's going to build Applegate Stables into the biggest and best equitation centre in the country. And smiling, she remembered the dreams of a young girl on a train as she sped towards the unknown destiny of her first riding school. For she knew at last all those dreams looked like coming true. The End well, I hope you've enjoyed this book as much as I've enjoyed reading it to you. Bye.